Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the weekly chart of the US dollar Mexican peso. And you can see um, the action that happened in the peso during the last financial crisis. You can see that uh, we had that spike. Uh, that amounted to a move from about uh, 9.75 to 15.75, I don't know what the percentages are, but that's a significant devaluation in the currency. And remember, the fundamentals of, of currency devaluation always have to do with uh, imports and exports because um, it's going to have to do with the foreign exchange reserve, the foreign currency that they have, and right now the whole system is based on the dollar. That's why these are going to be dollar crosses. We're going to see here when we look at Venezuela, it's going to be one of the stories we look at how uh, the uh, currency can just simply collapse. Now we know about nations like Zimbabwe and uh, Venezuela is very close. Argentina is on the way. But we're seeing this sort of thing dribble in towards the major currencies. In other words, it starts at the periphery. It starts at the weakest, um, most unstable economies, oftentimes the most socialist or centrally planned, we'll say. And and, and then it uh, it's now starting to move towards the major currencies. So here we have the Mexican peso. You can see effectively from the uh, bottom that was at the last financial crisis to where we are right now is a move from nine something to 18 something. So about a 50% devaluation, you know, in that time frame. Uh, another currency we want to look at is the Canadian dollar. Now, I know a lot of you uh, follow the news and uh, this is a pretty big news story because uh, people in Canada are reporting uh, very high prices on a lot of stuff. And again, you have to look at the a balance of trade and the foreign exchange reserves. And uh, you always have to ask, you know, it's all going to be dependent upon what country you're in. If you're in a country where a lot of the essentials are produced within that country, a devaluation of the currency is not as big of an issue as it is when you're a big importer. Now, we know that Canada is affected, kind of doubly affected by the oil collapse and the mining collapse. So for the longest time, Canada was very, very strong. You can see here, uh, around the time of the last financial crisis, we actually had the one-to-one -one peg between the Canadian dollar and the U.S. dollar was penetrated, and the U.S. dollar was really only worth about 90 cents to the Canadian dollar. Now, if you remember back in the 1970s, uh, for those of you who are, were around and stacking silver and looking at coins, if you remember, uh, sometimes in the vending machines, you'd uh, get a Canadian quarter, and the Canadian quarters were really worth um, a certain percent. I think it was three quarters of a percent, so 0.75 uh, on the dollar. And, uh, you know, you used to get mad when you got stuck with a Canadian uh, quarter because the only place you could use it was a vending machine because it was the same size and shape as the American quarter. But if you took it to a store, they wouldn't accept it because the Canadian dollar was signif worth significantly less than the American dollar. Now, this is being revisited. You can see here a move of uh, uh, 0.9 all the way to 1.44. And we're getting the stories now out of Canada about how much the the inflation is for food and so it's crazy stuff that's going on we're, we're seeing uh, this think of it like a disease we're seeing it spread towards the center and the center is going to be the US dollar it's going to start at the periphery and then it's going to get closer into the extremities and it's going to go right to the heart and the heart is going to be the US dollar now let's pull up the Venezuelan currency because uh, we're going to read a story here on what's going on in Venezuela. And, uh, you know, I've talked about uh, this crazy uh, bus driver, uh, Nick uh, Maduro. 
uh, Mad Maduro, I call him. And you can see right here we've got the official rate of six uh, Venezuelan, I think it's a Bolivar, to the dollar, which is utterly absurd. And we're going to talk about that when we get to that story. But let's jump over to this interview with Jeff Berwick. I wanted to take you to this interview because uh, Jeff Berwick really, he's... He's not someone that I agree with because he's obviously not a Christian and he considers himself to be an anarcho-capitalist. Um, now, I agree, to, I agree with him to the extent that uh, the government is completely out of control. And I also agree with him to the extent of the capitalist part that, you know, the, the answer to everything, of course, is going to be free markets. And he gives a very good explanation. But I want to play a little bit of this. You should listen to the entire interview because uh, he really lays it on the line. But let's start right here and listen to some of this. And, then, right. and, and we, we, we've been off the, um, uh, the, the gold, gold standard since 72. You know, Nixon brought us off or brought the U.S. off, uh, who, the U.S. being the reserve uh, currency, and said it was only going to be for a wee while. I paraphrase, of course, because he wouldn't say wee while. But uh, it's been that way ever since. Well, actually, he, he did say that. He, it was 1971, uh, August 15th, Richard Nixon uh, removed the gold backing away from the dollar. So back then, uh, the, the U.S. dollar used to be backed by gold, and that's why a, uh, almost every country in the world used U.S. dollars as reserve currency because they knew it was backed by gold. But the U.S got so indebted uh, by the end of the 1960s due to the Vietnam terrorist attacks that they were doing, which was all started by a false flag terrorist attack on one of their own ships where they tried to sink one of their own ships and blame it on uh, the Vietnamese. Uh, it was actually, I believe, Israel who tried to uh, fake it uh, and uh, got him into that war. And uh, by the end of the 60s, I, don't, uh, I think you're around the same age as me, so you don't remember, but I know by looking back uh, that uh, people were very fed up with all this war and killing uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of people in Asia for nothing, including outside of Vietnam. They were just carpet bombing Cambodia and Laos. Uh, massive, massive terrorist attacks again by the U.S. government, which is by far the biggest terrorist organization on the planet. Uh, so uh, people were, uh, the, they were bankrupt. The U.S. was bankrupt. They could not afford to pay back uh, any of their debts in gold anymore. And France actually pushed them and said, we want all of uh, what we're owed back in gold. And uh, they couldn't do it. So Richard Nixon took the gold backing away from the U.S. dollar. And to your point about it being temporary, he actually did say it was a temporary measure. And he said it was because of currency speculators that they had to remove temporarily the gold backing away from the dollar. It's now been over, uh, what is it, 40 45 years uh, since since then, and uh, I actually do think it is going to be temporary. It is actually going to go back at some point uh, once the U.S. dollar collapses, but uh, that's the state of affairs, and, and that as well is also why they faked the moon landings at the end of the uh, 60s and early 70s, hi was on, to get people's on, mind off. Are you trying to tell me <laughs> we haven't been to the moon? How dare you? Uh, there's no evidence of that. Uh, there's a lot of fake videos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he just uh, went but, there. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was all tied into that. And then again, they've had on the media. So great interview. Um, like I said, I don't agree with Jeff on on everything, but I agree with him on a lot of things. And uh, yeah, he just went there. But uh, let's look at this point he made about uh Nixon blaming on currency speculators. I had, I was not aware of that, and I don't know the facts, so I'll just take his word for it, that uh, it was said to be a temporary thing. That very well uh, may be the case, and blamed it on currency speculators. Now, let's take a look here at what's going on in Venezuela. And uh, this is a shocking story here, because I've told you for the longest time, uh, this madman Maduro... Uh, now, we had an election in Venezuela where the opposition actually got um, a majority, uh, actually a supermajority, and uh, two-thirds. And they, there's a possibility they can actually remove him from power, which would be a wonderful thing to get rid of this nutcase. But uh, I'll show you how crazy this guy is. It's right here in the story. Venezuela's socialist government decreed an economic emergency on Friday that will expand its powers and publish the first data in a year that show the depth of a recession fueled by low oil prices and a sputtering state-led model. 
The central bank, which has been lambasted by critics of President Nicolas Maduro's government for hiding statistics since the end of 2014, said the South American OPEC nation's economy shrank by 4.5% in the first nine months of last year. Inflation soared in that period to an annual rate of 141.5%, the world's worst. Venezuela's oil-dependent economy is forecast to perform abysmally again in 2016. Maduro lost control of the National Assembly in a December election due to a voter ire over this crisis. The government's decree, which the opposition-led assembly says it has the power to approve or reject, sets a 60-day economic emergency and would give Maduro wider powers to intervene in companies or limit access to currency. So you can see it's more of the same. Uh, It's absolutely insane that uh, they're talking about giving him more power and the ability to intervene uh, in companies. This is what caused the problem in the first place, is government intervention, and they're talking about more. We're confronting a true storm, Maduro said during his State of the Nation address to Congress. This is... Not Maduro's storm, as some believe. It's a situation throughout the country that affects every Venezuelan family. He vowed the country would continue servicing foreign debt despite slipping international reserves, negating growing Wall Street pessimism about a potential default this year. He also insisted the time has come to raise heavily subsidized fuel prices. So here's another pattern that you see with the FSA, uh, the free blank army, as Zero Hedge would call it, uh, eventually the free stuff goes away. The free stuff is starting to go away. The one thing that they had was that they were an oil producer and you could uh, get fuel for virtually nothing. Now, that's happening around the world. I just passed a gas station today where I saw gasoline at $1.51 a gallon for unleaded. So that's happening all around the world. Economists say... Doing so is vital to fortifying foreign reserves, but it's politically costly move that Maduro has avoided despite repeated promises. National Assembly President Harry Ramos, Henry Ramos, a longstanding opposition leader, offered a jocular 40-minute response in which he chided Maduro and his policies and laughed off the heckling of the Socialist Party lawmakers. Quote, what angst there is here, Ramos 72 said at one point. I guess since he's 72 years old, uh, I guess he's not too worried about getting bumped off. Uh, sticking his tongue out at the jeering legislators during the rare opposition speech broadcast on state television. Maduro, a former bus driver and foreign minister who was elected to replace Hugo Chavez in 2013, has stuck to his mentor's policies of strict currency and price controls. With massive shopping lines in Venezuela and widespread shortages of basics from milk to medicines, the government faces mounting pressure to change what critics called a failed model. Venezuela depends on oil for 96% of its hard currency revenues. The average price for its basket of oil and refined products fell this week to $24.38, the lowest level in more than 12 years. Quote, the biggest loser in Latin America of the decline in oil prices is clearly Venezuela. At this point, a credit event in 2016 seems difficult to avoid, Barclay said in a research note. The heaviest payments in Venezuela's roughly $10 billion foreign debt bill for 2016 came in October and November. The government blames its woes on the global oil scenario and what it says is economic sabotage by its foes. Quote, Venezuela is suffering a new generation of economic war promoted by, here we go, web pages which fix the Bolivar dollar relation without any criteria or economic substance. Now, can you believe that? The central bank complained referring to dollar today. Remember that site that I'm always going to, dollar today? Now, what is dollar today? It publishes a black currency price. Uh, to the fury of the government. So uh, let's go to Dolar today, and not surprisingly, the absolute worst quote on the Boulevard. Now you remember I showed you, here's the official exchange rate of the Venezuelan Boulevard. It's 6.2 to the dollar. But the black market rate, the real rate, the real value of that on the free market, in other words, the guys that stand on the corner and exchange your dollars based on how many boulevards they have in their hands and how many dollars they have in their hands and how much they want to get their hands on dollars, the free market, 
they're giving you 878 bolivars for any dollar that you can deliver to them. So that's what's going on. That's the reality of it. And that's just like Nixon. Remember, Nixon said that it's a temporary thing and it's caused by currency speculators and uh, will go back, but they never went back. Same thing. History repeats itself, or at least rhymes. So let's get over to the uh, privy issue. That was brought up on the member site here. And uh, this is the latest privy that we have. This is the 2016 Silver Kookaburra Monkey Privy. And I have to say, uh, just aesthetically, that's a fantastic coin. And uh, the price here... Uh, $20.80. Uh, that's pretty good. I mean, yeah, that's $5 above spot pretty much. There's about 434 of them. So the big question is going to be uh, for the for the members, how well do these privies perform? Now, I think the mint number, don't quote me on it, but it's going to be roughly around 50,000. And uh, 50,000 is a very low number. But I went to eBay and, uh, you know, looking at the the privy, I did a search here. You can see, I tried to do the most specific, but I did Perth Mint, one ounce silver, privy, kookaburra, and uh, doing them by lowest price first. So it's not surprising to see this this coin here that's on Atmax, and they're selling it for 2080 you can see here it's going for a little bit less. The lowest is uh, 2055. That's uh, an open auction and there's $3 shipping. So they're pretty close. Now, the big question is going to be not what this 2016 privy is going for, but what are the other privies going for? So we need to scroll down. Here's a 2015 Kookaburra privy. You can see this is going to be the goat privy. If you don't know how the privies work, is they it's the next year the privy is the uh going to be the the next year of the coin it, that's going to be the symbol so um we've got the uh i'm sorry it's it's actually the current year um so in 2016 we've got the kookaburra and then it's the the monkey privy in 2015 we had the kookaburra with the goat privy and you can see those are around 30 bucks uh, so let's get down to some previous years and see how they hold up. Now, this is actually one that I bought. Uh, I'm, I can't remember the reason that I bought it. It's a 2012 one-ounce uh, kookaburra with a dragon privy. I think the reason why I bought that one is because at the time I was convinced that the dragon was going to be a very special coin. That's partly because it was in 2012 and also because it was the dragon, which is a really important symbol for the Chinese. And, of course, I was looking at a Chinese... Um, you know, selling it, reselling it to the Chinese. So you can see that one's going for anywhere from, you know, 37, 38, 39 bucks. Uh, pretty good when you look at the current price of silver. We're, you know, 100% above spot. And so we're here. We've still got these dragon privies. Now here's a roll. This is going to give you a little bit of an idea of the bulk price. And Again, bulk prices are going to be different than individual coin prices, but we're around 25 bucks on the bulk. Um, so that's about it for those. Uh, that's not a lot of information. It's something you'll have to keep your eye on. But just based on the information that I've seen and just based on kind of an anecdotal opinion, I would say that the privies do not perform to the extent that the lunars perform. For me, the Lunars are a straight Chinese play. Uh, this is kind of a Australian play with a nod to the Chinese. Now, I've covered before in past videos how the uh, British Mint is doing uh, Chinese privies. Uh, the Canadian Mint is doing Chinese privies. I believe the New Zealand Mint was actually doing Chinese uh, Lunar privies. So this is something that's spreading. But still, for me, uh, based on the price analysis, I would have to say that uh, the lunar series, straight lunar series, half ounce and one ounce coins and two ounce coins, uh, and that's currently going to be the the monkey coin. Uh, from what I've seen, those coins, uh, if you bought the half ounce horses, uh, those are really taking off. So for me, the best money for your value is still going to be that uh, 
main Lunar Series coin. If you can get the one ounce uh, anywhere near spot, you want to get that. Uh, if you can get the half ounce uh, around that price, then that's going to be the second choice. And then the third choice is going to be those two ounce Lunar coins. They're still the tops in my opinion. So back to the charts. Uh, as I said, we're, we're having a currency collapse that is kind of a domino sort of thing going on. And the weaker currencies, it's starting at the periphery. Now we know with the Russian ruble that uh, the United States specifically attacked the Russian ruble. It doesn't look like the chart's going to, here it is. So the ruble is actually now challenging uh, new lows. Again, this is a US dollar ruble cross. So that means the US dollar is worth almost 80 rubles now. And you can see the size of that move just from, and I covered this already in previous videos, that the beginning of this move was around the Ukrainian, uh, we'll call it Ukrainian coup, because essentially that's what I believe it was. It was the United States overthrowing a traditional uh, Russian ally and putting in a, well, quote unquote, Nazi government. And you can see here that we're talking about um, a more than a 50% devaluation in the Russian ruble. And uh, I've already covered how Russian interest rates uh, have, have risen. The Russians are actually fighting this with interest rates. They're fighting it the traditional way. Um, they're not shutting things down. They're just trying to ride this thing out. Now, this we're, we're reaching a critical breaking point here. You can see that we have a massive flag formation. 